Trowling down biblical archaeology for the 21st century. That's us. I'm Gary Byers. This is our resident rock star, Dr. Stephen Collins. And uh, we're here to talk about how archaeology and science come together to demonstrate historicity of the Bible. And boy, do we have a story to tell. So an article that came out uh, in 2021 about a scientific team that did a study, 21 authors found 21 evidences of an airburst happening at the site of our excavation, Tal al -Hama. The article came out and um, people all over the world got really interested. Wow, could the Bible be true about that Sodom stuff? Well, that was some people. Other people said, this is stupid, can't happen, it's not science, and we really got pushback. A lot of support, a lot of pushback, and we're here to talk about today about the pushback, and you, you, are, you are up to the challenge. Oh yeah, we, um, all the people who are giving us the main pushback, I know these people. I've dealt with them, uh, I've talked with them, we have a reasonable working relationship with most of them, except in this case, they, they, they all have a, an anti-biblical bias uh, because somewhere in their education, they sort of wandered off into higher critical theory. They believe that all of the Torah literature is fictitious. Uh, Moses didn't have anything to do with writing the Pentateuch. Maybe Moses wasn't even a real person. All the stories about Abraham and, of course, Sodom and Gomorrah, the cities of the plain, are all mythical. These are mythical cities. And uh, so we're getting all kinds of pushback from the anthropology community, from the archaeological community. And by the way, every single one of the criticisms that have been brought forth, some people were even criticizing the photos that I provided from the dig that the and they were accusing the writers of the paper of retouching or doctoring the photos. Yes. Okay. Which they did, by the way, but not the photos themselves. What they did was changed my caption format to their caption format. So they, you know, tweaked here and there, showing an arrow or showing a line or showing a little, uh, a little word in there like a mud brick. This is a mud brick. Um, they changed the, but the photos were not, listen, I approved every one of those photos after the fact. Now, I did make one mistake on one photo. The, the, the north arrow they put in one photo was wrong. It was pointing south, not north, okay? So I had them fix that, but all the rest, in other words, everything that they were talking about that, that I gave them a photo to demonstrate was exactly correct. And one of the biggest persons who... I'm not, still not going to bring up his name, uh, uh, but he, is, he really latched onto this. And um, he, was, he was the guy that I asked to do the analysis first way back in 2007. He didn't do it. And so um, I, I don't know where, where this is coming from with him, but he latched onto that and tried to make that part of the, of the, of the narrative about the paper in, in, as a criticism of the paper. Well, um, we started talking. Because I, I did have his email address and I had talked to him before. So we started talking. And as we talked, it got more friendly. And interaction back and forth with each other. I shared with him, I've sent him all the, all the raws of the pictures. All the raw, untouched photos so he can for see. all the photographs so he can see. Nothing, nothing was changed. And now, even though some of his stuff and criticism of those photos is still out there, because you put it on the internet, it never goes away. So it's out there. However, in his correspondence back and forth with me, which is now very cordial and friendly and Merry Christmas and all, you know, all that sort of thing, uh, that's turned into a very nice, uh, I'm enjoying the relationship. I'm enjoying the time. We're, uh, hopefully he's enjoying it. And, but he has changed his tune. Now it has shifted from, I'm so glad to have seen the, the original photos. Now we need to turn to what it was. We can, he said, we can now both agree that there was an event. Now let's turn to what was it. So we, our, our photographer here, our, 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 our Italian film director, he's the guy who took all those photos. So he's, he's just breathing a sigh of relief. Yeah. Oh, good. My photos are legit. Well, I knew that, you know, he didn't stay up till midnight <laughs> doctoring photos, you know. Yeah. But anyway... It was a silly thing. It was, it was people it really were was. grasping at straws. 
not just straws. The straws had even disappeared. They were grasping at air. It was anything they could get a hold of to try to try to bring some level of discredit to this paper. Well, that, that has failed. Um, the criticism against the individual proxies and all the stuff the, that the scientists did have failed. So, so what's left? Well, what's left is um, I had one other big criticism from, the, uh, from an anthropologist. Now, I'm not going to bring up her name, but she uh, published uh, what, what really a lot of people called a hit piece on me uh, in, uh, in a, an anthropology magazine, an op-ed. Op and um, anyway, uh, I have answered it. That's going to be published somewhere. If they won't publish it, if they won't publish it, I will publish it. It'll get out there. But your answer started by beginning a dialogue with her. With her, yeah, exactly. I emailed her initially because I, I know her. And so we started talking, and I, I was pretty stiff, hard with her. You know, I was, I was pretty tough. Well, she said some pretty rough things. <laughs> yeah, she said some pretty rough things. And uh, so I was, uh, I was pretty pointed yeah. and um, scolded her a little bit. And uh, because I think she came to some wrong conclusions. She came to some illogical. She, she jumped because she listened to some other people. And I told her, you listen to people who didn't know what they were talking about. And to make matters worth, worse, they, didn't, they don't know that they don't know. Okay? They have no clue. They, they criticized. One, one, one archaeologist tried to criticize my interpretation of the, of the destruction layer. Has he ever seen it? No. What has he seen? A couple of photographs. He has no concept behind what he's talking about. No concept at all. Um, nobody would get away with it. Nobody should get away with that. And he's not going to get away with it. And um, so uh, we'll set that record straight. Very, very easy to do that. We have a destruction matrix that's a meter, meter and a half thick. It's a, it's a single event. We have multiple radiocarbon dates from the top of it to the bottom of it uh, concerning uh, the date of it. And there it is. I'm sorry, it's there. The pottery confirms it. We have the same pots up here and there and down there. Same pot th strewn through the matrix. It's easy to see it. It has a blowover effect. It has large chunks being slammed against uh, southwest facing walls. On the other side of the wall, it has very fine particulate blowover. And that's almost universal across the palace area. And so something is happening. We have vessels. You remember the one cooking pot, uh, sort of casserole cooking pot, that's about this far off the floor, and it is, it's all in, it's smashed, but it's all there, and it's smashed up against the southwest facing wall, up in the matrix about this far, off the floor. We never find anything on the floor, hardly at all. No whole vessels. Everything is smashed, churned, and strewn across floors, strewn across and through the matrix. And anyway, so I deal with this. But one of the things that bothered me about this particular article was she accused me, and of course, by, uh, may, maybe by, by uh, proxy, all the other archaeologists who believe in the Bible, right? Yeah. That if you identify an archaeological site as a biblical location, that it, that it fosters illegal digging, looting of artifacts from tombs, from archaeological sites, that somehow, if you call a biblical city Sodom, that, and in my mind, from her article, you would envision, you know, hordes of Baptists and Presbyterians and Pentecostals and Catholics out there, you know, pitching tents by the thousands and digging up cemeteries and doing all that, which of course is ludicrous. That's never happened, never will happen. That just doesn't, doesn't occur. And by the way, how many people in churches can we even get to be interested in archaeology? <laughs> oh, it's good grief. Oh, no, it's amazing. You know, nobody cares yeah. really. So to say something like this was completely irresponsible. That if you identify a city like Baba Dra in the south was identified by Walt Rast years ago by the excavator as Sodom. He identified as Sodom, wrote about it. Did he get criticized for it? No. No. But when I identify Tal Hamam as a potential site for Sodom, I get clobbered. I mean, and I brought this up to this individual. And um, so anyway, it's a completely unfair thing. Why? Because it's an anti-biblical bias. Yeah. Uh, to be honest, everybody knew that Schwab was not a Bible guy. 
So that wasn't something that mattered to yeah. him. Thomas he Schaub, Schaub yeah. or Rast. Yeah, they weren't, they weren't looking for Bible stuff, yeah. but they, they could see a possible connection. And, uh, but you are a Bible guy. You stand up for the yeah. Bible. And I say, in the, in the big Anchor Bible Dictionary series, who wrote the article on Sodom? Sure. Walt Rast. Yeah, Rast did, yeah. So anyway, uh, right. I bring it up. I bring up Tal Hamam as the most likely logical location for Sodom, and everybody goes berserk. In fact, what they said was, why are you, and this particular scholar said, anthropologist said, uh, why, are you, why are you even talking about these mythical cities? They, as if they somehow don't exist. Wait a minute, if you go back to Genesis 10, it talks about Akkad exists, a real city. Uruk, by the way, Akkad's never been discovered, but it's mentioned in the Bible, okay? Akkad, Uruk, Nineveh, Babylon, all these cities from Mesopotamia. Then it jumps over to the valley. Sodom, Gomorrah. So almost in the same breath, maybe they took a breath in between, but almost in the same breath, you mentioned the cities of Mesopotamia, which are all actual. And then it talks about Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities of the plain. In the same passage, why is one authentic and the other set mythical and and f for this particular scholar she would say well that's that's the consensus of opinion yeah. among archaeologists yeah and it's sort of you know it's sort of like you know dumb causes dumb causes dumb i mean you, you if you say something stupid enough times it can become a scholarly consensus so the illogic behind this whole thing is palpable, it's ridiculous, it's emotional. It's an emotional response. People don't want the story of Sodom to be true for whatever their reasons are. But the fact is that ancient writers, be they Egyptian writers, Anatolian writers, Mesopotamian writers, or Bible writers, ancient writers never make up fictitious geography. Whether they're, whether they're stories or characters or fact or fiction, those tales are layered over a real world geography that can always be found physically in the right locations. Okay, it, that's just the bottom line. And so Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities of the plain exist for those ancient writers uh, uh, in the Bible, exist in a particular location that they know well, they've been there, they've seen it, They've touched it, and they wrote about it. And so there it is. Now, you can, you can kick back against that all, all you want for our scholars out there who might be checking into this just for fun. Um, uh, you want to talk to me about it? Why don't you engage me directly about it? My email's real easy to get to. Everybody knows, you know, everybody who's a, who's a good scholar out there knows how to get a hold of me. You have a question about it, you really want to know the truth, call me, talk to me. Let's set up a dialogue, and I guarantee you will come away with a different point of view. So um, we'll put this out there as a little challenge. If you'd like to talk about it, engage about it. If you'd like to do some real science, then I invite you to engage with me. Let's talk science. Let's talk evidences, let's talk archeology, span let's talk stratigraphy and radiocarbon dating and how to analyze properly um, archeological remains. We can do that. And we, we've actually, this, this one article has, has spawned a number of folks uh, that have expertise in other fields, scientific fields, chemistry and physics, and, and they're talking to us about offering their help and in some, in some couple of cases, they've said, we don't really have any, any dog in this fight. We don't really care if it's Sodom right. or not, but I'm interested in this aspect or this aspect, and we're good with that. We, we want good science. Right. Nobody checked. We, nobody on our side checked who was on, on this 21 auth papers, yeah. authors, 21 authors of this paper. We didn't check on who they were, what do they believe about the Bible. That yeah. wasn't, first it wasn't our call. Yeah, we had no qualification. When we send our stuff up to carbon-14 dating, we don't want to know that the guy that's, or gal's doing the dating testing is a Christian or not and believes in Sodom or Gomorrah. We just want good science. The vast majority of the 21 authors on that paper were not out to prove anything one way or another 
uh, about Sodom. Nope. They, had, they had no dog in the fight. They were looking for airburst evidence. They wanted to confirm or deny the existence of an airburst that the kind of thing that they like to study, regardless of where it is in the world. Yeah. It doesn't matter whether it's on our side or, or in Greenland or, or yeah. you know, it's yeah. the younger driest boundary or, you know, it, it doesn't matter. They're interested in it and that's how they got uh, hooked up with us because one by one they began to come on and, and all the research began to be, listen, they did the hard science. It's the hard science. Now there are some guys out there who also do airburst research that are kind of rivals, kind of rival groups that, all, that always, no matter what, by the way, the guys who are on our paper, these guys are well published in, in, pub, in high level publications like the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences and stuff like that. And so, uh, you know, these are, these, these, these are not lay people. These are not people who are just out there. Listen, they, they know what they're talking about. And uh, like astrophysicist Malcolm LeCompte knows what he's talking about. And he's engaged with his critics a lot. And, his, and he points out very clearly where his critics are wrong. He's got criticism of the critics that people need to listen to. But I tell you what. People are not objective. I, I don't meet too many people who are objective on this issue, especially if they're in the archaeological world. You, you, you either accept the Bible that there's a, at least a modicum of historicity about it, or you don't believe there's any historicity about it at all. You believe it's all mythical. But I guarantee you're going to get in trouble, scholars, any scholars out there who believe that Sodom and the cities of the plain are mythical, are mythical cities, you're absolutely wrong. You're textually wrong, you're archaeologically wrong, you're historically wrong, you have nothing to stand on, and they do exist. By the way, we discovered the biggest city-state, continuously occupied city-state in the southern Levant that nobody else even had on their map with all of its multiple satellite towns around it. We discovered it, we put it together, we presented it in many, many peer-reviewed articles, it's there, it exists, and why didn't anybody find it before? I'll tell you why they didn't find it before. Because they didn't take the biblical Sodom narrative seriously. That's true. If they'd That's have true. taken the Sodom narrative seriously, they would have found Tal Hamam and all of its satellite towns a long, long time ago. And they would have been checking out the nature of the destruction event that took the whole place out of business and offline for 700 years. So, there you go. Um, don't shoot your mouth off, please, until you know what you're talking about. I know what I'm talking about in every aspect of this issue, and I'm glad to engage with you, anybody, get in contact with me. Well, tell us how you really feel about this, yeah. Dr. C. Yeah. Uh, this, is, this, is ex this is exciting stuff. We're, we're thrilled to be involved in it. And, uh, and you, not, you don't shy away from controversy, so here we go. Stay with us as we continue the ride. And if you want to get more engaged, more involved, uh, go to the website, uh, check us out, contact us, and we'd love to have you a part of our team. Love to have you part of, of the conversation with where we're going. Archaeology for the 21st century. That's where we are. Traveling down is what we do. Thanks for joining us.